All right. Now, um, it is my distinct pleasure to get to introduce uh, April. Um, you know, the first time that uh, I met April was actually at the February 2016 Tectio. And at the February 2016 Tectio, April delivered a presentation that was titled Leaky Buckets, Death Stink, and True Love, <laughs> which I think could be maybe the title of uh, Alex's biography, but uh, maybe also the least obviously awesome title for a presentation ever, and it was awesome. Uh, it was so awesome that we invited uh, April back um, the next year in 2017 to participate at the Best of Tectio at City Hall, okay, in the council chambers with the mayor in attendance and all the counselors and all that, and at which she proceeded to tell 10-year-old uh, potty jokes that had to do with um, brown sticks. Uh, and, and yet, she's been such an unbelievable, um, <laughs> and yet, that's the transition, uh, such an amazing part of the, the tech trial community, working with so many different uh, leaders in our community, in the city itself, to help us create real, genuine, um, durable successes in this ecosystem. Um, and when she first spoke, um, and we told her the presentations are five minutes, she said, there is no way I can even say my name in five minutes. So uh, here tonight with an entire event to share her ideas <laughs> is welcome, April, to the stage. I use both hands, it's so exciting. Yeah, so um, yeah, so the first time they told me I had five minutes and I said, I can't say my name in five minutes, so I took seven and a half minutes. And for two and a half minutes, someone was sitting there going, let, stop it, stop, stop, right, like that. Like that thing was going on. And, I, and then the second time they said, you can come back and do this one at City Hall. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm coming back for that. How much time do I get? And they're like, so much time, 10 minutes. And then I got 10 minutes. And that actually felt like luxury. And I did, I told a stupid joke that my son who was like 10 at the time told me, which was f not funny at all, but the mayor laughed because he's a politician and that's what they do. <laughs> and um, anyway, so this, so this time around, what's neat about this event is um, they gave me a bit of control over this. So I got to kind of curate who you're gonna hear from today. So this actually isn't about me talking. This is mainly about other people talking. Uh, but again, they told me I had five minutes. And so I probably will use more than that. Um, maybe seven and a half, because that's how I roll. Uh, what I wanted to start with is just um, a little background on the book. So if you bought a ticket here, the, the ticket comes with a book. If you didn't pick up a book, you should pick up a book. Don't leave without it. Um, and I wanted to give a bit of the history of how the book came about and what's in the book, at least as much as I can in seven and a half minutes. So this is what we're going to talk about. So it, it, this book actually has been in the works forever. It feels like forever to me. And the genesis of this book goes all the way back to my first job at a university. Uh, I studied engineering, not marketing. But the first job I got out of engineering school was in the marketing department at a startup. And I was assigned to a product that was kind of the dud product. It was not the product that the company was known for. It was the other product that didn't sell. And so I was in charge of that. And at one point shortly after I joined, we repositioned it. So the thing was originally positioned as at uh, Microsoft Access. You know, Microsoft Access is like a personal database, a little bit better than a spreadsheet sort of thing. We were going to be an access killer. <laughs> like anybody needs that. Nobody needs that. Nobody wants it. We launched it, and we had this access killer thing, and it went nowhere. And we noticed that people were using it in ways we didn't expect. And so one of the ways they were using it was as an embedded database on these newfangled things called laptops. <laughs> so we repositioned it as an embedded database for mobile devices. The thing took off like crazy, and it actually lives on today uh, as an SAP product called SAPI Anywhere. It's a billion-dollar business. 
So that twigged me to the idea that positioning is actually kind of an important, cool thing. But at the time, I had no idea what it was because I had an engineering degree and I literally couldn't spell marketing. We got bought by a big company. And in the process of that acquisition, my boss left. I inherited the marketing department. And the next thing you know, I've got 50, 60 people reporting to me globally. I've got millions in marketing budget. And I don't know anything. Like nothing, and 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 so I faked my way through that thing. I have a systems design engineering degree from the University of Waterloo. That's pretty much all you get out of that is like outrageous confidence. So you just go in and you're like, you're like, how hard can it be? It can't be as hard as mechanics of deformable solids, huh? That was hard. And so I faked my way through that job. I lasted for my couple of years to my earn it. Then I went to another startup, and we did the same darn thing. We had a product. It was a generic CRM for enterprises. We repositioned it as a CRM for financial services. The thing took off like crazy. We got acquired for over a billion dollars. Everybody was happy. And so this brought me to this realization, like positioning is this super important thing. I should learn what it is and how to do it in a repeatable way. Then I went to marketing school. And so in marketing school, if you take classes, which I have taken many, and you read books, like the book you're going to read after tonight, um, in, the, in these, all these marketing classes and books, uh, they're very good at telling you what positioning is. And there's a, there's a really famous book on positioning called Positioning the Battle for Your Mind by these guys called Rees and Trout. It was written in 1982. <laughs> before the internet. Most of you are probably born after 1982. Uh, and if you go to marketing class, they will, they will give you that book and you'll study it. And it's fantastic at defining what positioning is. And so this is more or less the definition. Positioning defines how your product is the best at the world at providing something that a well-defined set of customers cares a lot about. Put another way, uh, positioning defines who your target customer is. It defines what your differentiation is. It defines what your differentiated value is to customers. You can think of it this way. If marketing and sales is the house, positioning is the foundation upon which the house is built. So that's what I learned from that book. That's what I learned from all these courses. This thing is super important. It's the foundation for everything. It's fantastic. What I did not learn was how the heck you do it. Because nowhere in any of these books did they tell you. So I got this idea that it wasn't my job. So in all the startups I'd been at, I was given positioning by the founder, or I was given positioning by my boss, and they said, this is what we are. We're, you know, we're an access killer, or we're a whatever, and my job was to be the marketing person and make that thing sing. So my idea was, all I got to do is be a genius at marketing, and it doesn't matter what they give me, I'm going to turn that into the unicorn sparkle ponies. So they can give me their crappy position. This is a very technical diagram. They're going to give me their crappy positioning, and then I'm going to apply my marketing genius, and then this is going to happen. It's going to be amazing. And instead, what happened was, you know, they said, oh, here's this access killer, or here's this generic CRM, or here's this whatever. And so the poop went into the system, and then I applied my amazing marketing genius, <laughs> and what I got was slightly nicer poo. <laughs> That's what happened. So then I felt bad and I said, you know what? It doesn't matter how good I am at this stuff. This is going to be terrible. I actually have to fix this problem myself. Even if my boss doesn't think this is my job, even if whatever, if I don't fix this, all I'm going to be is the turd polisher. <laughs> and I don't want to spend the rest of my career doing that. None of you do. So uh, then I went back and said, well, that, you know, this is a fundamental marketing thing. There must be a process for doing this. And what I learned in marketing school 
is is this, is this actually is this. Um, so what this is is the positioning statement. This is of all the things I've learned in marketing and business in general. This is the dumbest thing I've ever come across. So when I took a class at Northwestern University, which is like considered the fancy pantsy marketing school in the United States, and in the in the positioning section, this is what they taught me. They said, okay, we have this statement, and you do this mad libs kind of thing where you just fill in the blanks. We are a blank for blank that does blank like blank. <laughs> and, and I'm in class, and I'm like, I'm, again, I got this engineering thing, right? So I'm like in the back, excuse me. So how do we know what goes in the blanks? And they said, well, trust me, you'll know. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't actually know because every product I've worked on, I could position it in multiple different markets. How do I know what the right one is? And nobody could answer this question for me. At one point, I got a job at, uh, at I'm looking for my friend from IBM. I got a job at, I, I got a job at IBM and, and I was working for this guy, uh, Paul Revo. And, and, he, and so IBM's got this world famous product release process. They literally sell it as, a, as an offering. If you want to learn how to release a product, IBM will come and teach you. It's world famous, it's whatever. And so I'm going through my first product release when I'm at IBM and there's a section there called positioning and I'm like, hoo-ha, I'm finally going to learn how super duper companies do this. And I get to the positioning section and it's literally, the, it's one page and it's this thing. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So my boss comes into the office and I said, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. This is stupid. And I just went on this big rant. I told him how stupid it was. And, uh, and, and, and he's the like patient. And he just went, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then he said, April, do you enjoy your paycheck? LAUGHTER and I said, yeah, I do. And he said, just fill out the darn thing. So then I, and then I learned there's a, there was an expression I learned at IBM. It's called malicious compliance. <laughs> this is when you do something strictly for the purpose of showing the person you're doing it for how dumb the thing is. And so the thing I was working on was a database and I had a, and I had, and so I filled it out and that was like, my database was a database that ran on things that weren't a mainframe. And so I filled this out and I said, for IBM buyers of database things, my database thing is a database that provides database stuff unlike other databases. <laughs> Never looked at it again. This is a hot garbage, that's what this is. That's my hot garbage thing. So, uh, th so this brings me to, to how this book came about. So, it seemed to me that there should be a process for doing this. We should have a methodology and there should be a way to do it in a repeatable manner. And the first thing I decided was, I'm gonna figure out how to do this and I'm gonna do it in a systematic kind of a way. So the first thing I decided was, look, if I look at the positioning statement, what's really important is the blanks. If I took the blanks and deconstructed it, and I could figure out how to fill in each of the blanks, then I could get this done. So in my opinion, the five components are this. It's what are my competitive alternatives? What are the unique attributes or features of my product that the alternatives don't have? What value does a customer get from those things? So what could, what, like, so what with those features for a customer? And then uh, there's what customers care about that value or my customer segmentation, who the thing is for. Uh, and then the last one is my market category. Am I a CRM or am I a CRM for investment banks? And if I could figure out how to do each one of those things, then I could figure out how to do positioning. It's that simple. But then when I started looking at it, it turns out, you know why we have no methodology for this? Because this is actually really hard, figuring out each of these things. And you have to do them in the right order. So I started testing this with the company. So first I built it for myself and I tested it when I was in-house as a VP marketing. And I tested doing it in different orders. And if you started in the wrong spot, what you got was positioning, but it wasn't necessarily good positioning, meaning it wasn't competitively differentiated. 
Then later, uh, I started teaching a class on positioning at uh, Communitech in Waterloo and the DMZ here. And I used all these poor sucker startups in there as guinea pigs for this thing. And so I taught a class and I had people doing this stuff and seeing where did it, how did it work and did it matter where we started? And it turned out the answer to that question is, yeah, it actually really matters where we started. So the methodology I came up with looks like this. You have to start with competitive alternatives. And when I say competitive alternatives, I don't mean competitors. So you, as a startup person, know an awful lot about your segment. And there might be a lot of little startups that are in your segment that compete with you for venture capital money, but they don't necessarily compete with you on deals. So your competitive alternatives are actually, if you went to your best customers, your happy customers, and said, what would you do if we didn't exist? In B2B, a lot of the times, they never mention those other competitors. They'll say, I'd hire an intern, or I'd use a spreadsheet, or I'd do it in Word. Uh, this is important. If you start with the wrong comparable, then you will get to the wrong definition of what your value is. If I say my competitor is some other little startup, and I say my big, my big value proposition is I'm way easier to use than that other startup stuff, but then you talk to the customer and the customer says, yeah, you know what I would do? I would hire some interns. Do you know what's really easy to use? An intern. It's like, Jimmy, get me a coffee. Do that thing while you're at it. Super easy to use. My differentiator can't be ease of use if the thing you're comparing it with is an intern or a spreadsheet. Anyways, that's the first step. The second thing is, once you know the right thing to compare it to, then you say, okay, what have I got that's unique? Capability-wise, what do I have that's unique? Then I go to these unique things deliver this value. Then I say, who cares a lot about that value and why? Which is my actual customer segmentation. And then the last piece of that is, if I'm trying to communicate that value to these people, what am I? Meaning, what market do I intend to win? Then it gets even more challenging. So once I figured that part out, I was like, okay, now I got a process and I can do it. Then you got this problem with the last bit. I'm gonna figure out what market to position myself in and it turns out there's three different ways you can do that. So either I go into the market and I'm gonna head to head take on the leader or I go into a market and I'm gonna niche out a market and just take on a piece of the market or I decide my stuff is so cool and so different and so whatever that I'm gonna create an entirely new market. For each of these things, there's reasons why you would do it and why you wouldn't. It depends on how competitive your market is and a lot of other things. Now, you might be sitting there saying, that's a lot of stuff, April, slow down. I'm sitting here in the wind tunnel of words, and, but I only have five minutes, and, and, and it's okay because I wrote it down in a book. <laughs> right? Thank you. And now you have the book. You didn't like it, and so there's no excuse. Now you know everything, and it's all in there. And that's my five minutes, seven minutes, maybe. Yeah, time's up. Um, but I have one more thing. So I actually have a couple of things. So um, I, I, I'm going to introduce the speakers and stuff. And I've been on this book tour uh, doing a lot of speaking. and. Um, and uh, this is pretty exciting for me because I've been monkeying around with this book like since the dawn of time. So, uh, so there's a couple of things I would like you to do as the audience. I'm going to give you jobs. So the first job is um, I got a hashtag. Obviously awesome. And what I would like to do is go back later on Twitter or LinkedIn or wherever your favorite place is to share things and look at that hashtag and see pictures of y'all doing stuff at this event. So that's the first thing. I want you to take some pictures and I want to go back and experience the joy tomorrow. What's that? Both, yeah, the TechTO hashtag too. <laughs> No, no characters for your tweet, just the hashtag. Yeah, like, like, it's okay if you use 100 characters on hashtags of your tweet. But yeah, but this hashtag would be good. <laughs> and um, so, that's, so that's one thing. Um, and, and, and I'm really into photos, so it would be really cool if you took some photos. Because, you know, when you're actually in the event and you're running around, you don't get to do as much stuff as you do. So what I do is I wake up the next morning and go, oh, that looked like such fun. Um, so that's what I want to do. The second thing is I went to an event uh, two weeks ago in... Uh, 
Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I was the keynote speaker at the biggest startup conference in Iowa. <laughs> Yep, and uh, it, it turned out it was really fun, but they caught me off guard because I, I flew in right before my talk and I came in and, uh, and I did my talk and they were a really great audience. And at the end of the talk, everybody stood up and did this giant long standing ovation. And I was like, wow, I killed it. Uh, and it turned out that that's a thing and they, they do it for everybody at the entire conference. And I thought, that's cool, we should just do that. Uh, so I would like you to do that. It's good exercise. <laughs> It's good exercise, and uh, and every, you don't just want to sit there all day. So what's going to happen is this, I'll introduce the speakers, and the speakers will come up, and they'll do their talk, and it'll be great. And then you will be motivated to rise to your feet and give them a standing ovation, and we will all be happy. Yes? <laughs> Try it out now. <laughs> what an audience. They're fantastic. Oh my God, this is, a, see, see, I feel great, you feel great, everyone feels great. Do you want to take questions? Do you want to take any questions now? Well, we could do questions. Do you want some questions or should we just jump into it or we could do questions at the end? Yeah? You have a question? Did you just make that up? Just no, up. just standing up. No. No, I actually went to I went I actually went to that thing and everybody stood up and I was like, well, that's fantastic. And I was a little disappointed later when they said, yeah, we stand for everybody. But it still felt good, and I thought I'm going to do that next time. I'm in charge, and today I'm in charge. Um, so do I do? You want, oh, hi, you made it. It's good to see you. Um, so do you want me to just introduce next speaker right now? Can we do that? Unless you have a question. Anybody want a question? We'll have time at the end. Yeah. Don't be shy. Some that are leading and then some yeah. that are lagging. Yeah, so the question is, um, what happens if you have multiple value props and some are leading and some are lagging? Uh, you often, most of the time, you have multiple value props. Sometimes you have, um, it, sometimes you have value props that are important at different stages of a buy cycle too. Like some are retention value versus acquisition value. And so you just have to capture those and then be aware of how you do it. For some things like the, the home page and places where you're constrained, you're gonna, have to you're gonna have to stack rank them and decide what's most important. But the rest of it is gonna depend on the campaign. Like for certain campaigns, we'll have a certain target and you're gonna adjust the value props. Other other campaigns will have other targets, and you don't have to adjust the value prop there. Um, what you don't want is a thousand value props all peanut buttered all over the place, which sometimes startups get into that where they just have too many and they're trying to be everything to everybody and so no one can figure out what they are. So I think you should have primary ones and then maybe secondary ones that you get into later. And then you may have some that are retention ones that you don't talk about at all when you're trying to land the customer, but your people and customer success are making sure that everybody's talking about a lot. Uh, yeah. And um, immediately took this exercise to the founder and had oh. a product to do this, and we did it a couple weeks ago. Cool. Um, and one of the debates that came out of it was one of our main value props is we are significantly cheaper than the alternatives in the market, which are very traditional. Um, and the debate that came out of that was we don't want to race to the bottom. Right. So what do you do when your strongest value prop that's resonating with your, um, your market is the price, but you don't want to set yourself up to be super cheap. Yeah, so so the question is what happens if your big value prop is the price but you don't want it to you know you don't want to just like so first of all the first question I'd be trying to push on is why are you so cheap? Like it like what why if, if that's really all you got to go on eventually the other guys can just discount and beat you. You've got to have a differentiator that's different than price. So to follow on that yeah. our I think she does consulting, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I. I, I <laughs> <laughs> but we could we could talk about it after if you want. But my but if I if I can predict if I can predict where I think you're going with that is is you'll have the differentiators and the price is kind of the kicker, right? So but the thing is is like if the differentiators on their own can't stand without the price differential, 
then I'd be worried about that because it means that the people don't put a very high value on those differentiators. And so either you're not describing the value in real enough terms that they're saying, yeah, that's kind of nice to have, but oh, you're way cheaper. Oh, okay. Because the problem is, is anybody can take a price differentiator away from you at any time because price is elastic. I can charge whatever. And the worst part in startups is you'll get some new entrant that's venture backed and they don't even care if they make money ever. Right? So you can't have price be the differentiator because you'll get something like Uber, right? Like the reason you all love Uber is because it's so cheap. You know why it's cheap? It's because it's subsidized by venture capital. At some point, they'll run out of venture capital, and you're going to pay twice as much for taxis. And you're going to be, oh, shit, what, what happened to those old taxis? Those were cool and cheap. And, you know, anyways, but, but, but that's, like, the price differentiator is, you know, it can help overcome an objection like, geez, I really love your stuff, and I really love your value. I'm just not sure about you guys because you're really small, and these other guys are big. And so sometimes... Sometimes you can get around that with, oh, we'll give you a lower price to start, or we'll, get, or we'll allow you to get going for cheaper. But if you see the value, then they should pay for the value later. So I don't like, price is not really a differentiator. It can go away anytime. Avery, you want to do one more question, or you want to oh, okay. get started? No, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting, I'm getting that, I'm getting All that. Right. At the back, they're giving me that thing. They're always doing that to me. Um, all right, we're gonna we're gonna move to the next speaker, um, who's Nadja, uh, and I've known her for a while now, and it's funny because we hardly ever see each other in Toronto. We almost always see each other speaking at big conferences in uh, glamorous places like Kansas. Um, and Detroit, <laughs> where we got flagged at the border and spent some real quality time. Uh, but uh, uh, she's the chief growth officer at Vengage. So if you're a marketer in the room, you've probably used Vengage to build an infographic or something like that. If you're a marketer in the room and you haven't used Vengage, what's wrong with you? Because they're excellent. They're growing like crazy. Uh, and that is responsible for a lot of that. And normally she speaks at big, big conferences all over the world, and she's a great speaker. We're very lucky to have her here today, and I'm sure you'll want to give her a standing ovation at the end, um, uh, but I will hand the floor over to her. Yeah, no pressure, April. Okay. Um, okay, so my name is Nadia, and I'm the Chief Growth Officer at Vengage. April told me to make this talk about positioning, so I put positioning in the title. Um, so today I want to talk to you guys a little bit about um, how to create content and position that content in order to drive targeted leads back to your site, and talk a little bit about how we did that at Vengage. So with many companies, uh, when we're creating content or companies that are leveraging content marketing, one of the things or one of the goals that we have is typically when we're creating this content, you know, we want to do one of two things, which is to educate our users and acquire targeted leads. Does this resonate with anybody? Is anybody using content for a different thing? Nobody knows what content is. Great. Um, okay, so some of the things that we can do in order to hit those goals is, um, and in order to identify what type of content to create is, you know, talk to our users, figure out what some of their pain points are, uh, figure out what they're actually trying to achieve. Another thing is, you know, some keyword research to try to identify what do we want to be positioned for? What do we want us, uh, our product to be known as? Uh, and of course, distribution, right? Like how can we actually take that content and promote it to other people so that they can in turn find that content? Resonate with anybody? 
one person. Okay, great. Uh, we're on to a good start. So what a lot of people do in this sense is they come up with the statement, which is, you know what, let's just throw a list of keywords together uh, and try to figure out what we want to be recognized for. And so they come up with these awesome words like content distribution platform or omni-channel distribution or, you know, content marketing solutions, all of these really fun buzzwords. Uh, and then what they also do is, you know, they spend a ton of money trying to be recognized for these, uh, for these keywords up to $19 a click for content marketing solutions. But what's even more shocking is nobody's really searching for these terms, right? 50 people in a month are searching for content marketing solutions and we're paying $19 a click to get this person. So it seems a little bit ridiculous. And what's happening is we're throwing all of this money at terms like this in order to try to get more people when no one's searching for these terms, uh, to come to our product or come to our solution that we've positioned as this awesome content marketing solution, right? So there's kind of got to be another way to drive marketing qualified leads or sales qualified leads at a higher volume and at a lower cost without you know, chasing down these prospects. There must be a way to actually drive them to our site based on keywords that they're looking for. So this is actually what we focus on at Vengage. Uh, we actually don't spend too much money on ads. Uh, we're in the process of doing a little bit of PPC now in order to leverage the keywords that we are ranking for and, and just drive more traffic to them. But we focus on inbound traffic and we're driving over a million organic sessions a month. Now, I, I decided to do a little bit of research on stuff like conversion optimization, leads, visitor to lead conversion rates, et cetera. And according to a survey by Marketing Sherpa, about 7% of SaaS, or SaaS companies convert at about 7% as an average, right? So this is visitors to qualified leads. And then after that, about two to five percent of those people, of those leads, actually convert into sales for the company, and usually it takes about 84 days for that thing to happen. Now at Vengage, I, I did mention that we focus on quantity of traffic, but we also don't forsake quality of traffic, right? We're still trying to focus on targeted acquisition. And we're actually succeeding at a general 10% visitor to lead conversion rate. So this is not just on main landing pages, this is across the whole site. And of those leads, we have a general conversion rate about 5% to sales, and then that takes about 30 days. So in other words, we're driving closer to about 40, 45,000 signups a week now. So these are qualified leads that come into the product and of roughly 1,000 upgrades or so in a week. Of course, this wasn't always the case. We changed our strategy a little bit here. I'm also gonna go over five minutes, maybe seven minutes. Um, so we changed our strategy a little bit back in, at the end of 2017, and we started to see a pretty big conversion rate there, and we started to see a lot of our content actually starting to drive better traffic, better leads. Of course, what we do is we focus on what we're good at, which is organic traffic and SEO, and identifying what keywords people are ranking for and what people are actually searching for. Uh, and in order for us to win at Google, there's really three main goals that we're going after. Th that is a higher domain authority, higher conversions and more traffic. For people who are not familiar with the ins and outs of SEO, these are essentially the things that you wanna win at. Now a lot of content marketers or a lot of marketers, what they'll do is they'll say, okay, great, I'm trying to achieve all of these things. Let me create that one magical unicorn piece of content and I'll successfully dominate in all of these awesome goals that I have for myself. And of course, like most of our dreams and goals, this never comes to fruition. I wanted to be an actor, but now I'm a marketer. <laughs> So maybe instead what we should actually do is break those goals into separate individual goals uh, and target each of them individually. Now you might be wondering, how is that going to get me my sales? Well, here's a little bit of an overview of some of our content. We have our sales page over here. So this is a page that actually drives most of our conversions. But if you can take a look, not a lot of backlinks, not a lot of traffic. However, we have other content that's focused on driving a lot of backlinks and building authority. And we have other content that's focused on driving a lot of traffic. And now what we do is we have something that looks kind of like this, where we have a bunch of authority focused on building brand awareness that we can then loop into building content that has better traffic that we can then funnel into content that's a little bit more specific and then funnel back down into our sales. So even though we have a content distribution solution or whatever the word is, 
Maybe people aren't looking for that specifically because they don't know what that is because it's a term you made up. Maybe they're looking for better blog ideas or how to promote my blog or something like that that we can then funnel them into, hey, maybe you need the solution to help you promote your blog, etc. So in a nutshell, what I'm really trying to say is one thing that you should do is pay attention to your audience. Try to understand and talk to them. Maybe what they're searching for is not necessarily what you want. And break down those goals to focus on them individually. And then use that content to guide your audience to the solution that will actually be what you're trying to sell. And that's all the time I have. So if you have any questions, tweet at me and I'll send you a link for more. Amazing audience. So you just do what you're told. Um, thank you. Um, all right. Next up is Hannah Abaza. She's the head of marketing for Shopify Plus. Which, if you don't know Shopify Plus, that's the enterprise platform part of Shopify, which powers all kinds of cool things like the New York Times and other amazing billion-dollar businesses like Kylie Cosmetics. Nothing. <laughs> Everyone's like, what the heck is Kylie Cosmetics? If I say that in the US, everyone laughs. Ha, ha, ha. Here, they're like, we don't know who that is. <laughs> we don't know who that is. Some American thing. Um, Hannah's actually the smartest B2B marketer that I know, not just in Canada, but I believe on the planet. And again, I think she speaks. Uh, she's, I see her more outside of Toronto than I do in Toronto on the speaking circuit and usually on big stages. So we are very lucky to have her tonight, too. So uh, here's Hannah. So uh, two years ago, I joined Shopify to build out the marketing function for Shopify Plus. As April said, we focus on that mid-market to enterprise segment. So you guys, this was like my dream job. It checked off all of the boxes. Was there demand for the product? Yep, tons of demand for the product. It had this palpable like market pull that you can just feel. Would we be able to hire all the people that we needed to do stuff? Yep, no problem, Hannah. Go hire all the people. No problem. Do we have budget? Yep, we have budget. We have lots and lots of budget. We're Shopify. We've got budget. <laughs> awesome. I was ready to go. I was super, super pumped about this. So I walked in two years ago, and I was like, no problem. I've got this. Three weeks later, this is me. <laughs> <laughs> Six weeks later, and I felt like I was chasing a fucking fire hose. <laughs> it was insane, and it was chaotic. And the thing that really stood out to me is at the end of the day, we had to go back to basics. Before we could start doing any of the marketing things, we had to answer that foundational question that April brought up earlier, which is how do we position Shopify Plus? So let's step back for a second. What is positioning exactly? So about a year ago, I reached out to April, because, you know, why not go to the source? And I said, hey, April, send me your best definition of positioning. So she sends me this. If marketing is about making it easy for people to find, evaluate, and buy your product, positioning is figuring out what your product is in the first place. I'm like, great, cool, I'll use that. Two minutes later, get another email from April. Hannah, I have a way better definition of positioning for you. If marketing can polish a turd, <laughs> positioning can turn turds into fertilizer. <laughs> Are we sensing a theme? Does this track for everybody? Yeah, we're good? Okay. So listen, ladies and gentlemen, this is the brilliance of April Dunford. She can literally take shit and turn it into growth, turds into fertilizer. This is magic. So how do we actually do it? Well, April walked us through at least the beginning part of how to do it. But here is what I've noticed time after time, year after year, team after team, company after company. Here's what usually happens. Marketers walk into a room with a whiteboard. It has to have a whiteboard. <laughs> they start talking in glowing adjectives and flowery terms, and they start talking about unicorns and ice cream and rainbows. And then pretty soon somebody starts puking rainbows. <laughs> And then it's infectious, and the person next to them starts puking rainbows. <laughs> and then marketers are really good at spreading the word, so the entire company starts talking about unicorns and ice creams and rainbows. And what you end up with is a big pile of shit that is completely meaningless to your customer. Positioning is not a thing that you make up. 
It is a thing that you discover by looking at the right inputs. So what are the right inputs? Well, that actually depends. It depends a little bit on your market, your business, but ultimately, you need to understand your customers and people that decided to not become your customers. You need to understand your product and the data around it, the data around any campaigns or marketing that you have been doing. You need to understand the market landscape the competitor alternatives, as April mentioned, and you need to understand how your internal teams are dealing this. And once you've got the inputs, you can start to figure out how do you actually piece together that positioning. Now, there's lots of good questions to figure out. There's lots of frameworks to do this. I'm not going to talk about any of this because all of you are going to read April's book. <laughs> <button. laughs> makes my job really, really, really easy up here. What I am going to talk about is that one piece that seems to trip up Company after company, startup after startup. How are you different? Most of us lie to ourselves about that, right? How are you actually different? So we touched on this a little bit earlier. Most of us want a position based on product. Most of us want to differentiate based on product. The reality is, particularly in tech, at any given point in time, somebody is six months behind or six months ahead of your roadmap. Positioning on product alone is incredibly difficult. Positioning on price is also fraught with a whole bunch of issues. Really easy to become a race to the bottom. So how do you start to think about different ways to position yourself? Well, here's just one example. Taking it beyond price and product, how do you dif differentiate based on experience? So about a year and a half ago, I moved, and I needed furniture. I wanted a chair preferably gray, so I went to Ikea and I went to Structube. Um, and I basically found these two chairs that are kind of exactly the same thing, right? Like I compared them and they were the same price, they were the same quality for the most part, uh, same effort to assemble, probably the same number of F-bombs dropped while I'm trying to assemble the thing. But the experience is completely different, right? We've all been to Ikea, it's like a warehouse. I feel like a college student when I'm going to Ikea. Structube is kind of like a posh living room. I feel like an adult when I'm in Structube. Exactly the same product, completely different experience. Now, there's actually a company based in Australia called Koala, also in the same space. They have an interesting take on how they position themselves. Here's a quick video. Maybe. Koala is positioning itself as the anti-IKEA. So about a month after that video launched, they put up this billboard outside IKEA in Sydney. <laughs> So this billboard got picked up by national media in Australia, and that weekend, Koala's sales skyrocketed, right? Who says billboards don't work? I mean, I say billboards don't work, but regardless, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, were, they worked in this scenario because it was rooted in positioning that actually was resonating with the market and messaging that was resonating with the market in drilling into a pain point. At the end of the day, sometimes defining what you're not can be as powerful as defining what you are. So for a lot of us in the room, we're struggling with a lot of these different ideas, right? That's why we're all going to read April's book at the end of it. So how many of you have a product that does one of these three things? It either saves you time, makes you money, or saves you money, right? Pretty much, pretty much everybody. Awesome. Guess what? So does everything else. You cannot use those as your differentiators, and you cannot use those as your value props. That's part of it. But those are the macro benefits. Those are too abstract. This is why there's a lot of sameness in the market. People talk about the same shit at the top of that level. It becomes meaningless to your customer. Great. So what do we do? We drill down, right? But if you go too far down and you talk really specific feature function, it misses the why. And you know what ends up happening? It becomes very company-centric. It's no longer about your customer. It's now about you. What you want is the space between. What you want is that area where you can combine the benefits, why it matters, articulate your differentiators in a way that's going to resonate with your customer. And as you go through the buying cycle, you calibrate whether you need to go up or down, depending on who you're talking to. So let's review. This is important. Three takeaways. Number one, read April's book, because she will tell you how to take poop and turn it into growth. 
Number two, find the space between. This is the important part. And number three, for the love of God, no more puking rainbows, unicorns, or ice cream. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Do we need, we need two. Um, so, thank you. That was awesome. Um, uh, next up, okay, where the chairs go. Uh, we're gonna do this fireside chat style um, because next up I've got uh, Dave Mackinich and um, some of you know him and some of you don't because he has this habit of working for companies that aren't here, even though he lives here. Uh, so right now he's the head of marketing strategy and product management at a company called Fiserv. So you, if you're watching the basketball, you might know Fiserv because the Milwaukee team plays in a thing called the Fiserv Forum. Uh, and so Fiserv is actually a gigantic publicly traded company that does like seven and a half billion with a B revenue with 25,000 employees. They're massive. Um, and we have the guy that runs marketing and strategy and all that stuff here. Come up. The rest of this program is pretty startup-y. This is your big, this is your big company part of the program. Um, so, so Dave's done. Uh, oh yeah, shoot, unicorns. Thank you. There's Dave. Um, and and I'll, I'll also say that you've done you've done this kind of neat career thing where you've been a bit of big companies like Fiserv and ADP, but also a bunch of startups. Like for a while, you were CRO or CMO, a CRO at Jobber, and then Quizio. I think you were also CRO, CRO at Quizio, VP at, of marketing at Jobber. Oh, whatever. Some big fancy jobs yes. and startup-y companies. Um, and so er earlier this week, Dave and I were having a beer. And he was telling me this story about the transformation that Fiserv is going through right now, and I thought that was super interesting. And so I thought we could maybe kick it off with that. Like, maybe you could tell us a bit about, you know, traditionally what Fiserv's been all about and what your job is and the transformation you're trying to go through right now. Sure. Can you hear me? Everybody hear me? I can just keep yelling. Does it work now? That's fine. I does that work? Hello? Hello. This fire is getting warm. Okay. Is that better? No, absolutely not. Okay. Try this one. There you go. We'll just keep passing it back and forth. Yeah, sure. Uh, so two things. First is, I'm glad you find it interesting. Our problem is horrifying, terrifying, and existential. So I'm glad that you, you like this. And the, or interesting if you're not in charge of fixing it. That's right. So basically, like, Fiserv, the, the sort of quick story would be, uh, before the dot-com bubble burst, there were about 22,000 banks and credit unions in the U.S. Banking market in the States is very different than here. Uh, before the financial crisis, there were 18,000. Now there's 11,000. Soon there's going to be 6,000, 3,000, et cetera. Uh, but banks themselves are thriving, right? Mm. And the average bank is getting larger and larger and larger, and small banks that can't innovate are dying or being sold. Yeah. Uh, and our bread and butter is the small community regional bank. So our clients are disappearing or merging and getting back together. Uh, as they merge, as you can imagine, they get larger. So they come back to us and they say the price I want to pay goes down. So we have price compression, merger and acquisition, it's about a $100 million a year revenue headwind that we walk into every year with. So that's problem number one, uh, which is difficult. Um, yeah, that sounds bad. It's actually. very difficult. Problem number two is at least at a minimum 40% of the entire value chain of financial services is being disrupted by startups or in tech companies. Incredibly well financed. There's 140-ish fintech unicorns in the world. Um, and this is like, you know, this is like Square. Square, Stripe, Stripe. Uh, Plaid, yeah. Robinhood. Um, Wealthfront, bunch like all the way through reg tech, real estate tech, payments, you name it. Yeah. And the real pain in the ass is like moving money from point A to point B, as some of you for sure know, is like the hardest thing in the world to do, even though it's the easiest experience for consumers. So all of those things are very difficult because that giant nut of revenue called uh, interchange, it's like two and a half percent of every dollar that travels through a pipe, 
$90 billion a year in fake money, mm. tolls, and then toll road, that will eventually get compressed and go to zero or some other number over time too. And that's how we make our money. And we do it with uh, on-premise mainframe-based uh, COBOL, RPG, Sweet. IBM iSeries technology. Like people and don't even know. Like it's bad enough you say mainframe and then you say iSeries and everybody's like, what's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like a baby mainframe. Nobody wants to know what that yeah. is. It's so, like, in the States, for instance, it's very common for, like, a small community bank to be, like, a small business. Five branches, 200 employees, family run, 130 years. 130 years in the family, god damn it, we're in moving in. <laughs> that happens all the time. And so the challenge there is twofold. One is you're, you're arguably selling to the least technically savvy buyer. And the second problem is they are pissed at you for being shitty old technology. Right. So you can't, you're kind of in a no-win casino there right. when you're also facing this headwind that you have to fight through every year right. to actually just fund innovation. But you aren't actually shitty old technology. There's just a perception That's that you are. That's the perception. Are. Right. Because people say things like mainframe and everyone goes, right. rah, rah, rah. How Even good though, could it be? It's yeah. running on that iSeries thing. I'm but, sure yeah. half this building is powering stuff no, it with is. mainframe. It I guarantee is. it. But um, we wouldn't talk about it because it's so uncool. Right. And that, that's our <laughs> positioning challenge. Yeah. So historically, we've been, they call them bank cores. So 40% okay. of every bank in the U.S. uses our system to run and build its transaction systems, bank accounts, payments, transactions, loans, you name it. 790 products in the portfolio. 790. 790 products in the portfolio. That's problem number three. I should run out of problems. I don't know. It's five, maybe. 790. 790 products. Um, How does anybody make sense of that? Because for, like, bankers, we are, I, we are people who look like they're pets. Follow me on this one. <laughs> if you go to the park and you see a dude with a bulldog, he probably looks like me, right? But if you see uh, somebody with like a, a small little dog that looks like it runs, it probably looks like you. Like that's just how it works. And so we built the business with bankers selling to bankers, right. and bankers are truffle pigs for revenue. Like if you leave a nickel in the carpet, they'll find it, right? They'll get in there and they'll go get it. So we built the entire business around being truffle pigs for revenue because we hit every problem with the product hammer. Yeah. So And our product suite looks like point solutions that can't stand on their own, but when fit into this jigsaw puzzle, everything kind of works. Yeah. And every time the banker comes and says, I have a problem, they go, we're going to build a product. And then we just go and hit the thing with the product hammer. Yeah. And over time, you just build a massive amount of technical debt We've acquired 180 companies over the last 15 years, so acquired add in all, all the integration problems. That, we that's just one spent, way to get to 700 and something products, just keep yeah. buying them. Yeah, we just spent $40 billion on First Data did, on, did in January. Did you hear that? They bought a company for $40 billion. Can yeah. you imagine so big you buy companies for $40 billion? That's kind of blew my mind. But yeah. yeah, I didn't really have much to do with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they called me in a meeting and go, so look at this. And I was like, oh, okay. That seems like a lot of money, yeah. yeah. Um, How but, many products are there in that one? No, just yeah. kidding. Yeah. Um, so, so you have this kind of existential, <laughs> right? Right, exactly. I'm trying to get it down here, people. Um, so you have this kind of existential thing that you're getting squeezed in the market, and then you have this perception problem. Like, what do you do to fix that? Like, what's your? Well, the first thing is we have to untether ourselves from our history, and that. Like, you know, that's a big thing in positioning in general, right? Like a lot of bad positioning is really rooted in how everybody internally even has traditionally thought about the thing. And, there, you know, and there has yeah. to be this kind of letting go of the old stuff so that you can move on to the new stuff. Yeah. Like, is that hard? Like, well, you have to let go of all the old people. Like, that's a shitty thing to say, but that's the first problem. Take care of the people, the products, and the profits in that order. That's why you're there. They're your new guy. Yes. You're like the new guy. You're a bastard. You're the hatchet yeah. man. <laughs> you're like hatchet well, dude. The, the, you're, you're like new sheriff in town. There is. So because of the way these companies get grown up, the people who know stuff are incredibly valuable because nobody else knows how this shit works. And it is, it's the world's biggest Jenga game you can ever imagine. And we have, like, you can swing a dead cat in our head office in Brookfield, Wisconsin, it's lovely this time of year, and pull out, you pull out a piece of the Jenga puzzle and the whole thing falls over, you can swing a dead cat, you can hit a Harvard Business School grad, an MIT grad, like you name, like smart, smart people, and they all come in and do the same thing. It's like, oh, this is easy, just do this and do that, and see, problem solved, and it falls right over. And it's kind of like those cartoons, like you pull a weed over here and a tree and like the other yard disappears. It's like, what the hell? Oh, man. And it's because there's a one guy in Lincoln, Nebraska, who built the integration in that one product that docks this other product. Oh, man. It's like, oh, yeah, no, never do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? 
Is that scene in Ocean's Eleven where he's like, no matter what, don't ever do, and then he walks away, and leaves Matt Damon standing there like, what? What? Don't do what? Is that, so that happens you, all the time. When you started, you like I remember when you started there, you were saying you had marketing and strategy, and then later they give you product management. Is yeah. that why? Because the stuff yeah. is so tied to product. Well, I think for me, my personal belief is that marketing is business strategy, and there's no yeah. way to separate those two things. Right? You talk about price or positioning, you name it. The, the economics of your business are indelibly tied to how you position, sell the product, how you generate demand. And I believe, you know, ultimately marketing's job is to create business value, whether for your shareholders or for your VCs or whatever. Um, and it has to be sustainable competitive advantage. Mm. In order to do that, you have to marry the go-forward product set. So all new people replatform, reposition. You have to marry that to the business's strategy, what's going to make it succeed in 2030 when there's only 3,000 banks left and 2050 when there's only 1,000 banks left. And then what you do is you basically, you ring fence all the smart people, so you don't get rid of them, but you put them in positions where they're just never, they're never gonna get an innovation job and they don't want one. Like right. they're the smart person who knows how the mainframe works, they know how to change an earnings code or they know how to change a parameter and then nothing else falls over. And you stick them in a great job and you, you let them ride off into the sunset and, and usually they're very happy and loyal and all those other things. And then you go out and you hire the people that can help you accelerate the business. Mm -hmm. And then you have to reposition the bit. Like, we are, we're in the process right Is now of repositioning the company. Is it hard to hire people because they think of you as, like, stuffy old mainframe crap? Like, do they look at you and go, Pfizer, that's a little cool. Like, yeah, luckily not. It? A lot of people know who we are, so that helps. <laughs> uh, most, people think I, that. Most, people, like... most people think I sell a little blue pill, so that helps, too. <laughs> so immediately. It's Pfizer, yeah. not Pfizer. Yeah. Yeah, um, I can see that. I get that actually. a lot. And I worked at ADP, yeah. which everybody thought was a security company. So I'm just, it's <laughs> a marketer. Yeah. This hurts me in my soul. Yeah, yeah. Right? You, could, you could suggest just renaming it. I'm sure that would go over good. It's that seven would probably, and a half billion. Yeah, revenue. no, that's not, that's not going to hey, go over well. Hey, you know what you do? Oh, they're, get, oh, they're giving me the tons. Am I getting the already? Yeah, no, I think we can still go. They're, they act like they're hard asses about this, but they're not really. Um, okay, well, okay, I'm going to ask you one more. One more. Uh, okay. So, uh, because I think this is interesting for people here, because I think most people here probably haven't worked at a company bigger than 25,000 employees. I mean, I got my friend from IBM over there. He's worked at a bigger one. But, like, anybody else? Yeah, so maybe we worked for Rogers? A handful. Yeah, the Rogers people. Go. Yeah. So what, what do you think? Like, you've done the, the, you've done the startup thing and the big thing. Like, um, thinking about driving a transformation like that, like, um, What's the difference between doing it at a little company and doing it at a big company like that? Like, uh, so in the st startups, ha startups problems are the exact opposite of big company problems. But those problems, if we're if you were to map them and measure them, would have the same relative impact. And so startups are afflicted with optionality. So like you have a million, you can go in a million different wow. directions every day, do a, a million different things. This is so true. Big companies are big companies are like the sun like you're this giant mass of energy and everything revolves around you and so you're you may have let off a solar flare and it's not a big deal but you've just melted half a continent you know however far away. <laughs> and so as a consequence of that you, you have to figure out ways to and and you're you're a slave to your 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 p l and you're a slave to your revenue model so you have to figure out how to break out of that and and because you're a publicly traded company the the pressures of the public market are such That's that a big one you're gonna to have to figure out a way to fund it yourself. Like I've never, and I was an executive at ADP for seven or eight years in different business units, I've been exec in different places. I've never sat in a room and someone been like, yeah, you just spend however much you like. <laughs> Whereas in a startup, in many cases, they're like, here's a million bucks, what are you gonna do with it? I'll give you two if you can show me something good with it. I'll give you five if you can show me something good with it. And, and in big companies, yeah, it's, so you have to figure out how to do that transformation and fund it yourself. And that's why you have to take very bold action as it relates to people in some cases. You have to be willing to shoot some of the 790 products. You have to be willing to segment in a market that's declining, which sounds easy and does real hard, because you, there are no new customers to acquire in some cases, so losing one is very painful. Yeah. And nobody wants to say no to a client, right? So those are, the, those are the things. And then basically you just have to be doggedly determined on your three to five most important things and no matter what happens, you will defend those three to five things until the data tells you otherwise. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, we're out of time, Sorry. but Dave Sorry. will be here, and you should ask him questions uh, at the end. And, and thanks Thank so you. much. Thanks for having me. Yeah.
you, you guys are next, right? You're, you're, no, somebody's doing, aren't you doing, we got a break now, don't we? Oh, uh, break? Something? What's the next slide? Oh, okay. So, you can see I'm well prepared for this. No, you don't, there's no slides here. It's very simple. We want you to learn something new, but we also want you to meet someone new. So take the next four minutes to talk to someone you did not know before tonight. Be friendly. Works. Uh, the good news is there's lots of opportunity to meet new people and hang out both after the event tonight and throughout the year uh, at Tech Trial Community Events. But we still got amazing content uh, to learn from tonight, so let's hand our attention back to April. <laughs> Hello. Uh -huh. um, uh, so this is the last session coming up, and um, we have a panel. So the panelists, can you please come and take your seats? Um, I'll introduce everybody. Uh, I've got. Oh, do I? Or should we like line up that way? Oh my gosh! Do yeah, you can do. It. Organize yourselves. Um, we got three people on the panel, um, and. This is pretty cool that I got all three of these people to come and do this. I'm pretty excited. So Ray, I'll start with Randy because he's closest. So uh, this is Randy Fitch, and he's the uh, co-founder and CMO at Uberflip. Uh, and I've known Randy since Uberflip was just a tiny little baby company, and they were they were in tiny little crappy offices and basement and stuff, and now. They were not, <laughs> and so and then and then, now they got really fancy, nice offices with a really nice gym and stuff, and they got like 150 employees ish around there, and I think they're hiring. You might want to talk to Randy later. Um, they also uh, uh, they run a really cool marketing conference in August called Connex, and uh, if you're a marketer, you should get a ticket because speaker lineup is total fire, including me. Wow. <laughs> and uh, and some and some good speakers and um, and yeah so so that's Randy yay Randy um, and then I've got and then I've got Kurt Simpson and he's co-founder and CEO of Wave which again I was trying to think of when I first met you and I feel like you you and me and your co-founder and, uh, and and David Crow sat on the patio at St. Louis and drank beer, it was, and it was 200 years ago. <laughs> I'm not making that up either. Uh, and so it's, it's been really cool to watch them become like kind of one of the super cool scale up companies in town. Like you guys are so big. Like how many employees now? You're 200 ish. 260, sorry, that's a lot more than 200. Uh, 4 million customers uh, tracking 200 billion of income and expenses on their platform. Like, it's super impressive. Uh, so that's Kurt. Um, uh, last and seriously not least is Jen Evans, who's literally one of my favorite people in Toronto. Um, she's a serial tech entrepreneur and a community activist, and she doesn't do either one of these things in a half-assed sort of a way. Like, like so, um, she's run a bunch of companies. Uh, she right now is the founder of Squeeze CMM, which is a content analytics platform, and she's killing it over there. And they just got accepted to this cool L'Oreal accelerator, and she's going to Montreal for the summer. Um, she's also the founder of the B2B News Network, which is the top-ranked site worldwide for B2B News. Um, she's also a co-founder of Tech Reset Canada with me, and I am also a co-founder there, and we're dedicated to making sure that innovation is focused on what's good for society and, you know, kind of causing sidewalk Toronto, sidewalk those guys, <laughs> sidewalk labs guys, a little pain. Uh, she's a board member at Hope. She's an advisor of the St. James Town Community Center. Um, so Jen's doing a lot of stuff. So that's Jen. Yay. Uh, so they told me we don't, we don't have super tons of time, and that's a bit of a bummer because we like to go over on everything. But we're going to try to to go through this first. But I want to start with Jen, actually. Um, and I, I want to start with you because you're running a bunch of different things and, uh, you know, and run a bunch of different companies. And so I, w I wanted to ask you, like, 
Do you think that sometimes companies sort of outgrow their positioning, and how do you see uh, a company's position evolve over time, and specifically for Squeeze CMM, because I know you guys have evolved. Yeah, um, and on a number of occasions, actually. I think we're on our third or fourth pivot at this point. Um, and I think, you know, there becomes a point in time, whether it's the market is shifted, your customers are looking for something new, uh, you're not able to charge the same price point that you were before. All of these can be indicators that uh, you may be ready to move on to a new type of positioning. And in our case, we started with content marketing analytics um, and competed with companies like like Google and Bitly primarily, um, and we use a taxonomy-based uh, ontology to help customers figure out the stuff about their content that you aren't measuring in Google or other platforms. So uh, what account, for example, on social media drove this interaction, uh, what time of day, uh, what type of format is the asset in. So we're able to produce some pretty interesting insights for marketers. Um, and so we got our, got our first set of customers with uh, with that value proposition. Um, and then it became pretty clear that they were like, we need a little bit more here. Like the insights are interesting, but what is what goes beyond this? And that's actually when we worked with April um, on, a, on a positioning uh, session. And we honed in then on content performance. So really looking at marketers who are looking to drive real business results with their an analytics um, and what content formats were performing best with which audiences, what we're getting to revenue faster. Um, and again, very much insights-based. And uh, our most recent iteration has actually been the data that we've been collecting as a result of that. So one of our customers came to us at one point and said, we want to take some of this and try and do some retargeting with it. And we said, well, it just so happens that we capture the IP address of every interaction with this B2B content as well and label it with the channel that it came in on, the format, et cetera. Um, and within six months, our, our SaaS business is, is still very healthy, but the data sales part of our business is now almost five times our SaaS business, and that was just pure repositioning. So That's so cool. Um, Randy, what about you? Like, I, I'm curious uh, about a shift in market category. Like, you guys have recently done a big shift kind of out of one category, and you're sort of creating this new category. Like... Um, Tell us a bit about that, like how Uber Flip's positioning has shifted over time. Yeah, it, it was someone. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> that was hard. Now I got to remember what I was going to answer. Uh, no, you know, it was for us. It was a similar evolution that that pushed us there. We we latched on to the term content marketing early on, and some of the functionality we had was very much built for the content marketer. But as we started to go more up market, and we work with really large, big companies like you know. Dave's going to buy from me sooner or later, right? Um, and you see that? Absolutely. The yeah, discount for you will be a good deal for us. But, uh, but no, we, what, what we realized was, and, and I don't mean any offense to Nadia, her, her presentation was great, content marketing, there's probably content marketers out here, but we realized that content marketing was a really messed up term, and we were trying to play in it, and the people that we were trying to sell our solution to were really talented writers. Now, I'm not talking about startups. Content marketers and startups, they do everything. They roll up their sleeves, they figure it all out. But when we get into these large organizations, all they really do is create content. And, and that's not easy. So we actually said, you know what, we don't want to be content marketing. We want to actually distance ourselves from it. Randy wrote a book. And what's the title of your book? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fuck content marketing. Fuck so content marketing. That's it was content. so so the book was first a blog post. It took me about four and a half months to convince my own team to publish the post because they're like, no, we're just gonna offend everyone who buys from us or will buy from us who already bought from us. Uh, but you know, the point there was that we wanted to drive to people was not, you know, people wanted me to call the book Stop Content Marketing. And I was like, no, 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 it's not about stopping to do it. It's one of these things that's like, fuck my job if this content's not gonna get used. And when we spoke to content marketers, they actually felt that way. So what we had to do is we had to figure out a way to distance ourselves from content marketing. We actually also predicted that 
some of the companies, especially in B two B, which kind of kind of plays back to that that point that Hannah was talking about earlier, like about the, defining what you are not. Absolutely, yeah. We didn't want to be IKEA. We didn't want to be that. Yeah, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with content marketing. There's great companies out there, but a lot of them have struggled. Like Oracle bought one that ended up a shit show. Uh, you know, one of the biggest content marketing companies called Compose yesterday sold for three x after like eight, ten years for like forty five million dollars. They raised twenty million. Like. It's, a, it's an industry that struggled to get off the ground, so we created a new category, uh, which is tricky itself. Uh, you know, I mean, that's why we do an event, that's why we do a podcast, that's why we write books. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost, you know, we have to advocate for the space as much as we have to get, advocate for our product, but it allows us to be a leader in it. So for us, that, that category is content experience. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, and it, you know, I, I spend a certain amount of time in the book talking about that because people like the idea of creating a new category, uh, but it's really hard to it's do. Not, it's uh, honestly, like really I, wish, I do. wish we were selling, you know, banking software sometimes. <laughs> uh, selling yeah, 60 products, though. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't it's, know. It's a really, challenge. I mean, I you, have, to, you have to... And, you know, as, as companies here scale, you'll battle. I mean, we now have a board. You know, the board sometimes is like, okay, like, show me ROI on this category thing. And I'm like, it's yeah. coming. It's coming. It'll be there. Well, and your, your investors got to be patient. Yeah, they are. Ours are, are good. Ours are good. But, but they always want to see, you know, w you know as, as Dave said, like, we'll give you an extra million if we can see how this conference produces ROI. Well... You know, it's, 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 I don't know, chicken before the egg. I don't know which one um, is the chicken and the egg here. But we, we, need, we need both to, to yeah. build this. And, and down the road, you know, one of, as, as you put in your presentation, there's, there's a lot of the things that we're competing against are so silly the way people are doing it. And one day people will wake up, even those companies will wake up, and they'll say, oh my God, we gotta get this, this new way to do business, the same, same way Dave's realizing, or Fiserv is realizing by bringing in Dave. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kurt, I, I, I wanna talk to you. So in, in the book, um, so Kurt was cool and let me interview him for the book. And so I, and let me write up a little story for the book. And he was cool about approving it really fast too, which I appreciated <laughs> because I had editors and stuff. And um, and I really love the story you told me about how Wave, you know, sort of how Wave started out as very much accounting software, and then you guys have kind of moved through this transformation of being bigger than that, um, you know, and it, and it tied into a change in the business model and everything else, so I kind of wanted you to talk about that. Sure. So um, what I've taken so far is that venture capitalists need to be patient, which I'm not sure there's Are many you a in venture the room. capitalist patient? Yeah, sure. no. <laughs> no. I don't think there's a venture capitalist on the planet that's overly patient. No, I think that's a rare kind of venture capitalist. Randy's got to introduce us to these patient yeah, exactly. guys. Okay, so Apparently they're on Randy's board. Yeah, that's right. You, you need growth equity, not venture capital. Oh, right, right? growth equity. Much, much, much yeah, more, more, patient. Right much there. more patient. Much more patient. Good yeah. people, too. Um, so uh, I told you the story of how um, we first came to market with a small business accounting tool very sexy space. We were looking for the the most sexy space to get into and thought small business accounting would be really great. So hot right now. It is. It is. We got that trend wrong. But anyways, um, and we were highly influenced by what Mint was doing on the personal finance side. And they had, this was peak Mint, it was kind of 2010. Everybody was using Mint, everybody was talking about Mint. Lots of innovation uh, that was happening out of that platform. Um, if they had to come out five years later, it would have been a completely different story. Yeah. Um, and, and so we looked at that and we thought, uh, there's a real market for this in the small business space. And we talked a lot about uh, price uh, in some of the previous presentations. And we were looking at what they were doing, which is it's very hard to get people to care about financial software. Uh, especially to create b budgets for your personal spending. And so thus, give it away for free, get a whole new set of users off the sidelines into, uh, into your tools, and then make money in different means. And so we brought that out and thought it was more relevant in small business than it was for personal, because personal, you don't use it. The churn rate is super, super high. Um, and thought we could make money off of advertising and data. 
what we quickly found out was that you need a lot of scale and that kind of scale is much easier to get on the consumer side than it is on the small business side. And so we had a lot of scale, but by no means enough to make that model work. Uh, simultaneously, we started seeing that the world of financial services was changing. Uh, Square came out with the dongle and that started to really change the landscape. If you think about it, the idea of embedding payments into software is now everybody's doing it. Well, that's a relatively new phenomenon over the that's last... That's really new. That's yeah. right. Uh, a small business owner, if you were opening a coffee store, coffee shop five, seven years ago, you would go and you'd buy your POS and then you'd get call up Moneris and get your payment terminal and those were two separate purchasing decisions. Now that's right. one. And so we started seeing what was happening there and started seeing that we didn't think it would just stop at payments, it would go into other financial services. And so long story long, we started repositioning the company into a more of a financial services uh, company, um, remained free, which has been an interesting journey for us. Um, uh, but through that process, signed up over 4 million customers and, um, uh, and are now really starting to gain traction on the, on the revenue side of the business. Like, what was the hardest thing there? Like everybody sort of perceived you as accounting software. Like how did you make that shift? Like how did you, how did you help customers understand, well, no, we actually do all this other stuff and not all of it's free either. And yeah, it's been a challenge. And to be honest, we're, we still, um, you know, I don't have 790 products, but we've got a lot of products, and so positioning is a challenge. And it's a constant challenge and one that we're developing new muscles in. I will say that my belief, and, and maybe it's just me, um, but I don't think so, is a lot of startups, especially in the Canadian ecosystem, do not put nearly enough value on marketing in the early days. Um, we all care that. about getting the incredible developers and the incredible product people and the incredible data people and the incredible ops eng people and really like almost at the bottom of the list is an incredible marketer because most of us don't really fucking understand what you guys do. <laughs> yeah. no, that's, and that's part I, of it. I love the idea of it moving the needle on the business but quite frankly like it's it unless you see it in action you just don't believe it to be true. And I think we were like so typical in that realm, like highly, highly, you know, tech focused, product focused, et cetera. And marketing was like, you know, a person and a, and a intern, back to your point, right? Yeah, yeah. Interns. And I think we got spoiled because we found out kind of, we, we did nail the initial positioning and we got really good SEO. And so we started developing this funnel where we sign up like 50,000 customers a month. And honestly, all of that was pretty much luck. And then, what? but you know, it wasn't the biggest fire, so we didn't develop it, we didn't invest in it. Um, but that's a big regret. Oh, is that interesting? Um, I got a question kind of for all of you. I don't know how much time I have, so you guys will have to give me the hook like you always do. Um, so, um, like, how do you know? How do you know if your positioning's working? Like, how do you? And how do you know if it's not working? Uh, that's just for any of you who wants to answer that. How do you know? Like, is it just, do you feel like it's gut or? Yeah, uh, I'll jump in there. I, I think, you know, it, it's tricky because the question is who do you want it to work with and what's an indication of success? Um, you know, obviously when your customers come to a conference that has the name of the category you built, you start to feel good about yourself. Uh, some of the stuff that, uh, that our product marketing team is here tonight uh, is doing a great job with is, is starting to influence analysts, right? Um, and you know we're we're playing in a world where we're selling to big organizations, and they read these analyst reports, or at least we believe they do. Uh, and so what we need to do is we need to influence these analysts, which is hard to do because yeah. they they have their they have their top track, and some of them have been doing it for ten years. So to suggest that they need a new category or quadrant or wave or whatever whatever term they put to whatever they do, that's hard to do. So there's there's different ways to break in to, to say your positioning starting to break through. I think you know getting your customers to repeat what you're saying is, is really the key. Uh, we try and do that on things like uh, G2 Crowd, if people know, or now it's just called G2. Um, 
they repositioned. Uh, uh, G2 and, and... You don't want to just be the crowd. Yeah. You just, <laughs> they, they bought a two-letter domain. They must be doing okay. Yeah, that's uh, right. so, so they, you know, what we were able to do there, which was really cool, was it, we knew it would take a lot longer with our with analysts to break through and get them to create a way, like we've been focusing on Forrester, but what we were able to do is work closely with G2, make relationships there. They built their term for Wave is grid. They created a grid for content experience and let us set the criteria. Once that happened, you know, I, we go talk to Forrester or Gartner and we're like, you know, it's, I'm, I'm really excited to see when you guys are gonna follow G2. Right, and, yeah, and so you start that. to trickle it and then you start to see customers who are seeing the G2 thing or start to see you know, tweaks to how Forrester releases their reports. I think this influencer stuff is, is really important if you're doing category creation play because you gotta sort of justify, does this thing deserve to exist? But, but like how about the, the, the other two? Like if you're, if you're not creating a new category and you're yeah. sort of, you used to live in one place and now you're somewhere else, how do you know that's working? For us it was, <laughs> I, am I audible? Oh, thank you. It was going from customers going, oh, yeah, this is interesting. Oh, yeah, this is nice. Oh, so a palpable level of excitement, like amped up when we got to the point where we had something that they needed, they knew they needed it, they hadn't seen it before, and it was going to change how they were doing things in a fundamental way, and that was the lights going on for us. You got some bad. Really well, just, you just a couple things. I mean, one is uh, I think you can look at the data and understand whether or not, like, what a conversion rate's happening and all that kind of stuff. And then the second is I just like to listen to the customers. And, I mean, there is nothing like Twitter for getting immediate customer feedback. Like, I, I love negative it. negative feedback, actually. Yeah. Like, okay. you're saying, yeah. Yeah. Just yeah, but, but even, like, their, even their language of how they're saying that is indicative of whether or not you're hitting the right buttons, right? Yeah. I, I, I move to Q&A. I was just about to do that. <laughs> We're going to move to Q&A now. Um, yeah, you, uh, so I'm going to open it up. Uh, you guys want to ask some questions? You want to take one? We'll take one. Uh, and we'll, 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 well, actually, no, sure. we're not going to ask. Hey, guys. Great talk. Uh, thank you for taking the time. My question is, at which point do you realize that this is a positioning problem or it's a product problem? Because a, a lot of you know, common theme that you guys have is it's understanding the user, you know, understanding their needs. But at which point is the product that's really not solving the need? I'm just curious. I got a, I have a real, I, so I, so I have a theory on this is, um, and it's important for me now because I'm a consultant. And so people will call me up and say, hey, fix my positioning. And part of what I have to figure out is, is it actually positioning or do you just have a shit product that no one wants to buy? And it's because I can't fix that. And so, um, and what I, what I find is this, if you have customers that are super, super, super happy, like um, customers that love you, customers that f refer you, customers are super, super happy, it is unlikely you have a product problem. Yeah. And particularly if what you've got is people that come into your funnel, the first time you talk to them, they're like, what do you do again? And how do you do that? And yet the ones at the end of the funnel are like, I die without you, you're so amazing. Oh my God, I love this. That there is a disconnect between what people that use you know and understand versus what you're trying to communicate them at the, at the beginning and it's just not working. So, and that's my opinion, but I don't know. You guys can answer that. Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, if you start out and you're not solving a problem or the problem is not being solved in the right way, then the issue is the product. If it's how the product is being used or how well understood the application of the product is, then it's a positioning issue. Yeah, I, I mean, the only thing I would throw, I don't know if this is working, so I'll speak loud. Uh, it's working. All right. Uh, <laughs> and you're speaking loud. And both. <laughs> so I, I, I'll go back to what Kirk was saying before. I, I think talking to customers will help you figure that out. Uh, you know, my definition of talking to customers often is getting more out on the road, uh, just based on the type of user we have. And it was interesting. Uh, this was like, about a month ago, Serious Decisions is this big marketing conference, and I was at it, and I was fortunate to have lunch with the CMO of SAP. So like really big company, and usually I, I wouldn't actually 
get any perspective from the CMO, being really honest. Uh, but she was actually considering being a board member, so we, she had seen a demo and things like that. The coolest part was she started to describe not her perception, but she's like, the problem is my team thinks you do something completely different. She's like, I took the time to take a look at it, but they thought you were something else. Now, in our case, they thought we were something a few years back. Um, so it, it, it kind of comes back to Jen's point. I mean, earlier, it's you constantly have to evolve what your positioning is to make sure that people know what you are. Uh, you know, we've, we have evolved as a company, not necessarily always in pivots, but expansion of what we do. So back to the product question, you're, you're, a lot of us are always gonna be short on the product side. So the question is, how do we position what we have today, but also position more of a vision or mission of what we're trying to accomplish? Question? Oh, sure. Hi. Um, all of you spoke about repositioning a product at some point in your career. You made it sound kind of easy. Were there challenges? Like a little bit. I mean, it's like it didn't work, so we repositioned. Uh, what were oh, some of the challenges? There are, there are decades. <laughs> like <laughs> internally, were there challenges? Did you lose customers? What, what was kind of that journey? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's not simple. It, it's a lot of iteration, uh, and you have to really. I think you know everybody on the panel has expressed this really well. It, it comes down to what's the customer need and are, what problem are you solving, and how are you are you articulating what you're doing to solve that problem. Um, that probably sounds really simple, but if it were, then April wouldn't have written a book. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, April wouldn't have written a book, we wouldn't all be sitting here trying to figure it out ourselves. So um, in a way, your positioning work is almost never done because markets are evolving, customers are evolving, and it's really important that you're able to stay on top of what those changes imply. I'm not a marketer, so it was easy for me because I just asked the marketing team to do it and then <laughs> told them it didn't look good enough and we tried it again. <laughs> um, no, I, th I, I think in, in our situation it was much more organic and it, it took a long time. And I, I would honestly say we're not even there yet. Um, so again, this is back to, you know, there's tech debt and everybody pretty much understands it, and but there's marketing debt too. And um, I, I think, you know, we've all got to get to a better understanding of what that looks like and what is the value of getting it right. Yeah, so I, I, I remember, the, I think the year was 2013, if I remember right. We had a really big customer, which was Hootsuite at the time. They were rocket ship, things were going so well. And back then, our, our ACV was like so low. We were like, you know, 50 bucks a month, so like 600 bucks a year. And it was wild. Hootsuite was paying us 500 bucks a month. So we just thought, we thought we had hit the jackpot, you know, our ACV now is, is like 50K, right? I mean, 500K, Dave. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but no, seriously, though, no. I remember, so, so Hootsuite, you know, spending all this money with us, and, and they called us, and, and they canceled, right? They had gone so deep, and we had done so much for them. And I went home that night, and I cried to my wife. Like, it was like, I thought it was the end of the world because we had kind of set this as what we could be. But then we actually took a step back and we were like, okay, well, what happened there? And, and I actually went out, we spoke to them and everything like that. And the feedback we got was, we would gladly pay you $100,000 if you were this, right? And, and it's like, we like everything that you're promising. You're just not there yet from a, from a customer service perspective, from a flexibility of the platform perspective. And that was when we actually realized, like, we've built, we're building something that really big companies are struggling with more than small companies were. Uh, and and it, had we not lost Hootsuite at that moment, we probably would have never pushed ourselves to make that change. So, you know, I, I think you have to, like, not always take some of the things that you're hearing personally, but really reflect and say, like, should we shift completely, right? Like, the, the, the trickle that happened after that is we went from gaining very few customers per month, you know, you know, you guys probably see thousands of customers a month. We were seeing 
you know, hundreds, uh, and then all of a sudden we went to, you know, we're bringing on 10 to 20 a month, and we're losing more customers than that. So you have to change the way you celebrate success internally, you model for success, everything around that. Last question. Make him do it, no pressure. <laughs> Hey, so me and my wife drove from Boston, Toronto yesterday and read your book out loud to her the entire trip. Oh, and wow. uh, so, <laughs> so I thought, yeah, because I thought it would be romantic. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, and we got into this big argument over your book this morning, but I can't even remember what it's about. My question is... If you're creating a category, how do... So we teach kids how to code, and we think code is like means a whole lot of things to a whole lot of people, but we want programmatic literacy to build the software engineers of the future, from first keystrokes to, to first job. Like, but how do you position that? Like, we're just, we're, how do you create the category and positioning, and how do you get it right in, in 15 seconds or less? <laughs> So it's for you. You call it. You call it. You call it. It's important to have good marital relations. <laughs> this is more important than anything else. Um, uh, well, you know, it, it, so that I, I heard two questions. So one is like, how do you make sure you get your positioning right? And the other one's about this category creation stuff. I think that category creation is really, really hard. And I think it's really hard to do when you're very small. And, and yeah. you know, Randy's taken a good, solid run at it, but he's also not two people in the base been anymore. He's getting to be a pretty big company. He's just raised a big round. He's got this unicorn of patient investors that nobody else has. Um, so, I, so I think category creation is really hard. I think the payoff is really big if you can get it right, but I think it's really hard. So most of the time I would say you probably don't want to do that. The, the, the second part of how do you make sure you get it right is, again, that's kind of the nut of the whole book, but I think there's lots of ways to get it wrong. Like I think comparing yourself to the wrong competitors is the easiest way to get it wrong. Like, like you, like even for something like you're running a coding school. Like, do you compete with other coding schools, or do you compete with learning how to code online, or do you compete with not learning to code at all, or do you? And I can't answer that question, but your best customers do know the answer to that. And then once you understand that comparable, then I think you have to kind of stay open to the fact that you might actually be something that you don't think you are right now. And so you need to get the comparable right so that you can get the differentiators right so that you can be expressing the value right. And I don't, I don't know, like you, you guys obviously read the book, and so maybe I did a crappy job of explaining that in the book. Sorry. Um, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah. You need a you need a you need a, a, you need a mic or something because I can't hear you, or you just come up. I've never seen his legs work without the little thing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know they did that. <laughs> He's tired. He's winded. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Uh, I've, done, I've done a lot of the positioning work on the product so far. And um, I, I do think that the, uh, the groups that we've created are actually accurate, but we haven't gone through the whole book. And I was paying attention to the part of your slide that dealt with context. Yeah. And so I'd like to sort of have you discuss a little bit more the impact of context on positioning and product. Yeah, so in the, in the book, I kind of de describe positioning in a market as like context setting for a product. So yeah. if, uh, if I tell you I have a product and my product is CRM, I haven't told you anything about the product yet. I just say, my product is a CRM, who's my competitor? Salesforce, right? What, what, give me three features that it does. Yeah, it probably tracks accounts. It probably tracks deals through a funnel. It, you know, I probably track contact 
Like, just by declaring my product in a certain market category, I triggered a bunch of assumptions in your mind about what my product is all about. Now, if I do a bad job of declaring that and the assumptions that I trigger are wrong, that's where the confusion comes from. So I had this company call me in their, their email for lawyers. That's what they told me they were. And so they're giving me this demo, and they're like, we're lawyers, and we have this thing, and it's special email for lawyers. I'm like, are you kidding? Seriously? They need special email? OK. And, and, and I'm thinking they compete with Gmail, and they're probably pretty much free. And I asked the guy, I said, show me the calendar. And he said, oh, we don't have a calendar. I'm like, dude, your email, like, like you, know, you know what you call email with no calendar. It's crap email. That's what it is. <laughs> but it turns out that what their special feature, like the thing they could do really, really well, was this neat context-aware file sharing, which we also don't expect email to do. So they basically took this product and picked it up and put it in the team collaboration space. And that switch in context trigger different assumptions. So I say, oh, your team collaboration, who do you compete with? They're, they're team collaboration for lawyers. So who do you compete with? Well, it's probably Slack, and that's better, because that's not free, and I don't need a calendar, so good. And file sharing is right in the middle of what I do. So that shift in context changes our expectations about what the product's all about. And, and the coolest thing was the pricing, right? Because you would expect email to be free, but team collaboration, people pay a lot of money for that. And then these guys are team collaboration for lawyers, right? So you're like, well, team collaboration for lawyers must be even more expensive. And I kept telling the guys, I was like, you know what you should do? You should call up the lawyers and tell them that you're going to charge by the minute. <laughs> you tell them that and see how they like it. But, but the expectation for everything, pricing, features, who my competitor is, everything, expectation is different. And so it's, it's like context, right? It's like context. If I see Beyonce up on stage with a thousand backup dancers and whatever, whatever, like it, it, she's a rock star. But if, if Beyonce shows up and she's incognito and she's singing at the local bar or whatever, you, you think she's pretty good, but you probably don't think she's Beyonce. So the context matters. Can I, can I add one, one thing? I and I don't know whether it's helpful, but based on what you said, uh, it triggered something. One of the successes that we had early on was we tapped into an emotional connection. So the front page way back in 2010 was um, essentially lose the shoebox. And for any I small- I love this thing so much. It used to be on our home pa homepage. And like, as a person who was, like I was using the shoe box at the time, and I was, it just struck dread into so me. So every, like every small business owner knows exactly what a shoe box is. And so the thought process of, I can get rid of this thing that's driving me nuts that creates all sorts of tension in my life. And I have no idea whether or not this works for your business, but as a, as a, uh, a father of three, all I think about is my kids better learn to code in order to you know, thrive 20 years from now. And so you need to tap into the emotional connectivity that every parent has about the future of their child. And to me, you will go to the moon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you April. Thank you, the panel. Happened. Sorry. Thank you, everybody. Yes. <laughs> Take a bow. Take this away from me.